Well, thanks, Chair. Thanks to Dr. and Rulant for the invitation. It's always really nice to be back at the Institute. I think this is my first time since the pandemic. Um, so things have changed a little bit. But, um, okay, great. So uh, what I'm going to do is the idea is I want to talk about some ways to upgrade some old uh, floor theoretic invariants from contact topology. Um, and this, this will all be this could all have been done sort of within the realm of conduct and symplectic geometry, but the but the motivating thing for us recently was uh, that we were exploiting a connection to uh, another area of mathematics, which is I'll just call it cluster theory. Um, so we have, we're sort of exploiting a connection to that, but also importing some ideas from cluster theory. And so this is an ongoing project, but it's it's I think been pretty exciting at least for me so far. Um, so th this is partially joint with. Uh, uh, this is an AIM square group. So this is Roger Casals, Hong Hao Gao, Lin Hui Shen, and Daping Wang. Maybe Eric Zaslow. Uh, I don't know if I'll get to that. Uh, but it's going to take me a little bit to get there. Okay, so um, great. So the principal geometric objects that I'm going to consider today, this is going to be a fairly simple situation in context topology. So the objects of study are going to be um, Legendrian links um, in standard contexts R3. So R3 this is R3 equipped with the standard context structure. Um, the standard context structure is the so I'll use the kernel of dz minus y yes. Uh, and by link, I, that's my shorthand for either not or like. So it, it might have multiple components, just a, a one-dimensional um, submanifold inside of standard conduct R3. Uh, and a link is, so what does Legendrian mean? So a link is Legendrian, uh, the name, so I'm gonna call it lambda, is Legendrian if it's everywhere tangents to the standard context structure. So, um, standard context structure. Uh, and if this is the case, so that just, that just means if you pull back the one form dz minus y dx along this uh, link, then you get something that's identically zero, which in particular means that uh, so because this is identically zero everywhere, you can you can actually just encode these links by, I'm going to use uh, what's called their front projection. So that's the XZ projection. So if you project to the XZ plane, you can always recover the Y coordinates by uh, setting Y as DZ DX. And so, um, so here's a nice example that I think will pop up sometimes because it's fairly illustrative. And this is the right-handed trefoil. So it looks something like this in the XZ plane. Uh, and so what you can see is that as, as opposed to sort of normal uh, knot diagrams, these ones have some singularities. They have these semi-cubical cusps on the left and the right. So the reason for those is because, again, you're supposed to be able to recover Y by the, the slope of this. And so you can't have any vertical tangencies. And so this is what takes the place of vertical tangencies. Um, the other thing to note, I guess, in this projection is that wherever there is a double point Singularity, uh, I don't actually, so I've, I've specified which one is over and which one is under, but you can in fact um, deduce that from just the picture because again, Y is DZ DX. So the one with, I guess, more negative slope is above the one with more positive slope. Okay. Uh, hey, Josh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So uh, great. So there's an associated construction uh, that plays a role in this, which is the symplectization R3. Um, so this is just going to be R3 crossed with uh, the real line. I'm going to put uh, the uh, coordinates T on the real line. And so the, uh, there's a standard symplectic structure on this, which is in these coordinates of D, E to the T times alpha standard. I didn't actually break this down, so this is alpha. Standard, the standard contact one form on R3. Um, okay. And maybe uh, the, the thing to note is that 
Uh, if lambda is Legendrian in R3, then you can get a Lagrangian cylinder in uh, the symplectization just by, by crossing this with, uh, with R. So R cross lambda with Lagrangian again, R cross lambda. Okay, so um, here's going to be my cartoon picture of R cross R3. So this is R3, this R here. And then inside of here, I have a Legendrian uh, link lambda, or so let's say it's a one component knot in this case, um, then I can just take the cylinder over it. And this is a perfectly nice Lagrangian uh, cylinder sitting inside of R cross R3. Okay. Um, so we can uh, generalize this sort of Lagrangian to build some sort of category. Um, this is mainly going to be motivational, but sort of helps to center the discussion. So I, what I want to do is I want to build, so we can build a category. So this is going to be some sort of symplectic version of the, uh, the cobordism category in, in the smooth setting where the objects are let's say oriented knots or links inside of R3 and then morphisms are cobordisms in uh, R3 cross an interval. So something similar here. So the, who's, we can build a category whose objects um, are oriented um, Legendrian links. And what are the morphisms? So the morphisms are, um, are given by uh, a particular sort of cobordism. So the cobordisms are called exactly Lagrangian cobordisms. So here's the definition. So let's say that lambda plus and lambda minus inside R3 are oriented Legendrian links. Um, so an exact Lagrangian cobordism uh, from lambda minus to lambda plus. Uh, so what is this? So this is. Um, This is going to eventually be a Lagrangian surface and in, sitting inside of R cross R3. Um, and it's going to satisfy certain properties. So, um, so the intersection, uh, the, the, the piece of it that's at uh, high T coordinates, um, this is just, this agrees with the Lagrangian cylinder over lambda plus. And similarly for the other side. So here's the picture. The picture is something like this. So here is R cross R3 again. Uh, T minus T. Here's lambda plus. Here is lambda minus. And then the, in the min, middle, this can do anything, something that looks like this. Um, so uh, what makes this exact Lagrangian is that, uh, so the symplectic form is exact. And it's, so it's primitive is a one form. And this, the statement is that this one form itself is exact on, on L. So, um, So this restricted to L is exact. So in particular, that uh, forces L to be Lagrangian, but it forces L to be Lagrangian and also to have sort of nice Fleur theoretic properties. Um, okay. Uh, there's another condition here that I'm not gonna write down, but uh, uh, you need a little bit more than this in the case where lambda plus or lambda minus have multiple components. And that's that the primitive of this, uh, of this one form needs to be actually honestly constant on both of the ends, um, the, and that's that's so that you can actually so that you can glue these sorts of things together, um, and which is to say you can compose morphisms. Okay. So um, that's that's a little bit of motivation, and then what I want to do is I want to talk about 
a particular invariants of Legendrian links uh, that are, so what does invariant mean? So they'll be invariant under um, isotopy of Legendrian links, but also hopefully they will be nicely functorial with respect to these sorts of morphisms. So if you have a cobordism between two Legendrian links, then that will give you a map from the invariant of one of them to the invariant of the other. That's at least the, the hope, um, which is partially realized for now. Uh, oh, uh, one more thing I wanted to say before getting to that is that there's a special type of exact Lagrangian cobordism um, that will be uh, important to us, and that is uh, the case where the, the bottom end is actually empty. So special, special case. Um, so a filling. <clears throat> Some people call these exact Lagrangian fillings. I, I'm just going to throw those out and just call these fillings. So of a Legendrian link uh, is a cobordism from the empty sets to lambda. So, um, picture is now something like this. Okay, so there's there's nothing down to minus infinity. Oh. All right, so uh, so let's so what we're going to do is we'll study these Legendrian links through Fleur theory, and in particular, um, we'll study Legendrian links through an invariant that's it's commonly now called Legendrian contact homology. And I think a number of you are familiar with this already. I'm going to sort of breeze through and not actually define this, but try to just sort of hit some major points so that I don't get stuck in the details. Um, so um, this was something around maybe 25 years or so ago. So um, this was work of Eli Ashberg, actually I'll say Eli Ashberg and Hofer and also uh, Chikhanov. Uh, so I don't know if Elmer will agree with this, but. So yeah, so it's, it's Yasha had this had this general idea, and Chikanov made some sort of combinatorial model that which has become very influential. Uh, and so the the uh, invariant itself uh, is the homology of something called the so it's now called the Chikanov Valley Asperg uh, differential graded algebra. Um, so I'll write it as uh, scripts math cal a lambda uh, and curly d, uh, and and the nice thing about this is that in the setting that we're dealing with here, where lambda is a Legendrian link inside of R three, so so you can do this in more generality for other contact manifolds, but in this particular case, everything is is combinatorial. So there's a Chekhanov came up with a nice combinatorial way to write down this differential graded algebra. Um, and its homology, so this is some sort of graded algebra. If you take its graded homology, this is um, Legendrian contact homology. Uh, so I'll write it LCH star of lambda. Okay. Uh, and I will say something about this, but again, let me, let me just try to say some general facts about it. So the, the main theorem is that if uh, lambda and lambda prime are Legendrian isotopic, which is to say that they are isotopic through Legendrian. So these are both Legendrian links and they are isotopic through Legendrian links, embedded Legendrian links, um, then their Legendrian contact homologies are isomorphic. Um, so this, I don't know, in this setting, I would attribute this to uh, Chikhanov and Eli uh, If you want to, so that's sort of mod two. If you want to incorporate orientations, then maybe there is some paper of um, Etnayer and Savloff and myself that did some bit of this. Uh, but th this is sort of the general result, is that we get some sort of invariant of Legendrian links. It's actually a little bit stronger than that, so there's some equivalence relation on these sorts of differential graded algebras, which Chekhanov called stable tame isomorphism. Uh, and 
it, it, it in particular implies chain homotopy equivalence, which then implies that the homology is actually a, an invariant under isomorphism. Okay. Uh, let's see, where am I? All of these boards are okay? Yeah, okay. So, um, so I, I mentioned uh, th this this sort of category that I constructed out of these things. So, so one nice thing about Legendre and contact homology, and this is something that follows from sort of the philosophy of symplectic field theory, is that uh, that LCH behaves um, nicely, which is to say, functorially. Uh, I'll say uh, slightly more precisely. Uh, under cobordisms, or by cobordisms, I mean, sorry, exactly the grounding cobordisms. Okay, so um, the precise statement that I'm going to write here um, was proven by Ekholm, Honda, and Kalman, but this is really building on ideas of Eliasberg, Gibbenthal, and Hofer. Um, so the Ekholm, Honda, Kalman paper maybe. Uh, Appeared on archive in 2012. It's if you look at the the printed literature, it, it appeared much later than that. But uh, I like to attribute things to when they appeared on archive. So I'll say this is from uh, 2012, and this is that if you have some sort of exact Lagrangian cobordism, so now I'll just draw it in cartoon form like this. So let's, let's say I have an L, which is an exact Lagrangian. The board of them between lambda minus and lambda plus. Then, well, each of the two ends has this uh, differentiated algebra associated to it, so a lambda plus and a lambda minus. And the statement is that this cobordism gives a map uh, downwards, so it goes from from the plus end to the minus end, um, and this is a map of. This is a different map of differential graded algebras. Um, okay, so in some sense, you can think of this uh, Chicano Valley Ashberg differential graded algebra as being some sort of functor from this category that I described here to the category of DG algebras um, something along those lines. Uh, okay. So, so far I've said uh, some general properties of this, but I haven't actually told you anything about uh, how these invariants are constructed. And I will continue really not to tell you how they're constructed, but I'll at least try to say enough that I can move on to the next thing that I want to get to. So the algebra um, A lambda, this is generated by um, the red chords of lambda. Uh, so these are right. So these are integral flows of the red vector field that begin and end on the Lagrangian. Uh, and uh, let's assume that we're in generic position. So there may be. Uh, I'll just label the red chords of lambda by a one through a n. So these are the red chords. Um, and I'm going to take a slightly simplified version of this algebra, where um, I'm just going to let this algebra be the polynomial ring generated by. These rib chords. Uh, each the rib chords have some sort of gratings on them uh, that are given by Conley Zander indices. And so you can you can this is a graded polynomial ring, uh, but I'm sweeping all the details under the rug. Uh, the, another thing that I'm sweeping under the rug is it's for technical reasons, it's it's important to also place a base point on each of the components of the Legendrian. And so the base point also gives some generator in here, but I'm just omitting that. Um, okay. Uh, oh, what is K? So K is just, uh, so for the purposes of this talk, it'll just be your, whatever your favorite field is. Uh, okay. Um, for now, this can be anything uh, in a little bit. It actually is important for my results that this field, it does not have characteristic two, um, which is a little bit awkward because the way that the, the you know, if you don't want to orient moduli spaces, then originally the invariant was defined over in Z mod two. Which famously does not have characteristic not equal to two. Uh, but okay, so anyway, so 
uh, once you orient your moduli spaces, then you can actually do this with coefficients in Z, and in particular, that means you can do it with coefficients in any field. Um, okay. So the differential, maybe I'll at least draw a cartoon version of this. So, so the differential counts um, holomorphic, pseudo-holomorphic disks uh, from, so these are maps from a disk with boundary to the simplectization of R3 with boundary on the Lagrangian cylinder, which is R cross lambda, um, with one, one positive puncture and arbitrarily many many negative functions. So what does this mean? Um, so in lieu of defining this, I will draw a picture. So the picture is the same picture, uh, one of those pictures over there. So this. So first I'll just draw um, the simplectization, and here's this the Grundin cylinder. So this is R plus lambda. Uh, and then, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to map a disk into here. This disk is going to have some number of punctures on its boundary. And one of the punctures will be asymptotic to a red cord up in the plus infinity direction in the R direction. And the other punctures will, will map to be asymptotic to red cords at minus infinity. So what will end up happening is it'll look something like this. This may have plus, minus, minus, minus. Um, this maps into here. Um, again, I, I found that if I try to actually rigorously define this, it takes up enough time that then I can't get to other stuff. So I'm, I'm just going to use this cartoon picture. Um, so what, what this contributes to is if this report up here is AI and the reports down there are AJ1 through AJK, then this particular holomorphic disk, I, I haven't, I've left out some noise. So you should be rigid holomorphic disks. This particular holomorphic disk will contribute something to the differential AI. And that what it contributes is the product of the negative ends. And then if there are more holomorphic disks, then there'll be other terms here. Okay. Uh, great. Okay, so this was all, uh, this is this is all sort of old news. So this has been known for, for quite a long time. Um, and what I want to do is I want to talk about a, a uh, an elaboration of this of this particular structure. Um, and so, just just for intuition. Um, if if one tries to apply the the uh, philosophy of symplectic field theory to this picture, um, you can count various holomorphic pseudo holomorphic curves with boundary on R cross lambda, and you you can then sort of build up this structure through various levels. And so I would say this is sort of the first level. This is the level where you have a single positive end and arbitrarily number uh, many negative ends. Um, so it turns out that that um, unlike in some other Fleur theories, you can't just uh, it, it, you can't just build up a theory with a single positive and a single negative end. There's some reason why you have to incorporate all of these. Um, so anyway, this, this is sort of the first level of, of symplectic field theory in this case. Uh, the next one would be if you continue to count holomorphic disks, but allow for arbitrarily many positive ends, um, then this is, this is called rational symplectic field theory. Uh, and then you could keep going and start adding in genus. So everything here is a, is a disk right now, but one could look at genus or maybe um, curves with multiple uh, boundary components, uh, or even you know include descendants or something into this picture. And that that I'm not going to talk about at all. But I do want to sort of poke my head into the next level of this beyond Legendre and contact homology, and that's the level of of rational symplectic field theory. So, um, <clears throat> so by counting by counting. Uh, instead, uh, to the homework of disks, uh, with arbitrarily many positive functions, and not just one, 
one. So this is a uh, rational subjective field theory. Um, so uh, we can assemble. So, okay, so great. So you can count these rigid holomorphic disks, but then the question is, what's the the right algebraic structure to assemble these into? And um, there was some work done by the done on this in the particular setting of Legendrian knots and lengths inside of R three um, by myself back in. I feel like it was probably 2008, 2010, something like that. Uh, and also independently, uh, Tobias Ekholm has, has some alternative version of this. Uh, both, both of these are sort of versions of rational symplectic field theory in this setting. Um, and so for instance, my, my version ended up with some sort of uh, curves DG algebra that, that incorporates these things. Um, but what I want to do today is I want to actually assemble them into a slightly different form. And that is going to be the form of an L infinity algebra. So, to infinity algebra. Um, so here is, this will just write. So this theorem is from last year, but uh, so when I was going back through my old papers, so that I have an old paper on rational symplectic field theory from, as I said, I think probably 2010, um, where I realized in the introduction, it says amusingly, so, so it says, also you can construct an L infinity algebra out of this, and this will appear in future work. So it just took an additional 13 years or so to, <laughs> for it to actually come up, come out. Um, and the reason was, it was basically just that I didn't, I didn't feel like it was, that exciting to write down, but now, now we we have some motivations from other things, and so now it's been written down and sort of improved on a bit. So um, here's a the theorem. So let's say that lambda is a Legendre link in R three. Um, so then this Chekhov Valley Ashberg differential graded algebra can be extended. Um, to the structure of, uh, so it can be given. The structure of uh, what's called an L infinity algebra. Um, in fact, uh, so L infinity. So I, I feel like people are pretty happy now with A infinity algebras um, in sort of in symplectic geometry. Uh, L infinity algebras don't show up quite as much, but so I'll, I'll discuss them in a second a little bit. But in fact, what what we end up here is um, something, uh, a slight improvement on an L infinity algebra, which is, it's called a homotopy Poisson algebra. So actually, a homotopy Poisson algebra, which I think sometimes in the literature is called a P infinity algebra, but at that point, I, this has become obscure enough that I, I feel a little bit reluctant to use these terms that nobody knows. Um, so, Okay, so so what is what is the structure of an L infinity algebra? So this is uh, a collection of maps from uh, they're basically just symmetric or sign symmetric, anti symmetric maps from um, exterior products of this algebra back to itself. Um, so if you like, these are just multilinear maps on the on this algebra with uh, that take values back in the algebra, but then they are symmetric or anti-symmetric in the inputs. Um, so we get something this such that um, L1 is this original differential of DD. Uh, and so I haven't told you what's the, what, so these, these LN, these operations have to uh, satisfy some sort of compatibility relations of which maybe I will write down the first couple. So firstly, uh, so I feel like maybe it's it's more useful instead of writing down the, the abstract definition or saying that this is somehow equivalent to some sort of DG co-algebra. Um, maybe, maybe I'll try to 
actually write something. So L1 is a map from A lambda back to itself. L2 you can think of as a map from um, A lambda tensor itself to itself, but again, it's going to be symmetric or anti-symmetric in the two inputs, depending on grading. Um, it's anti-symmetric. Um, and so the, the way that you should think of this is this, this L1, this is a differential. L2, think of this as like a Lie bracket, uh, except it will not be a Lie bracket. And the reason it won't be a Lie bracket is that it won't satisfy the Jacobi identity on the nose. It'll satisfy it up to some further homotopy. Um, so, right. Uh, so, the, so the L infinity relations, um, the first one is just that L1 is actually differential, so L1 squared is zero. Um, the next one is that L1 is a derivation with respect to L2. So it's, this is the usual sort of L1, L2, you know, this is, uh, then there's a sign, uh, L2 goes x on L1. This is really just this. Yeah, what I said, this is the derivation property. Um, and the, then the next one is, is the Jacobi identity up to homotopy. So I won't write it all down, but. So there are terms like this, and then the, the cyclically permuted terms. I'm not putting in signs here. So, so if this were an honest Lie bracket, then these three things would add up to zero, uh, at least up to signs. And instead, it's something involving uh, something involving um, L1 and L3. So again, these should, uh, if you're familiar with A-infinity algebras, this, these are very similar. The only difference is, uh, again, that this, this symmetry in the inputs. Um, okay. uh, so that theorem actually sort of degenerated into my attempt at describing what an A-infinity algebra was. Um, but I should say maybe two things. One is where do these other operations come from? And then the other one is uh, the other one is uh, what properties does does this thing actually have? Um, so the the maybe I'll say what properties this thing has first. So the L infinity structure. Uh, which is a lambda uh, along with these um, LNs. Um, this is invariant under the Jandrian isotopy of lambda. So this this somehow subsumes this the invariance results uh, that I wrote up here. Um, so it's invariant except that it's only I, it became a little bit of a mess and I was trying to do everything combinatorially. So I, so I actually have only checked this up through, I've only checked this up through the second, so L2. So th this is, uh, this is essentially that there's, so if you have two Legendrian isotopic uh, Legendrian links, then they both have L infinity algebras attached to them. And there is an L infinity morphism between those algebras where I have checked that that morphism actually is a morphism up through the second level. So uh, it's, it's not, not super uh, exciting, except that it's, it does have some nice consequences, which I'll try to describe in a second. Um, okay. But you, sorry, saying again, so, so the L infinity, there's no problem with the L infinity morphism, but, it, but it's oh, equivalent uh, to L2 or? There, actually, I don't know. I haven't constructed the L infinity morphism okay. uh, generally. But I've constructed so an L infinity morphism has a bunch of terms in it. There's like an F1 term and then an F2 term, et cetera. And I've I've constructed it. So F1 was already constructed. I've constructed F2 and checked that it satisfies whatever it needs to satisfy. Uh, but I haven't checked anything beyond that. Um, Is there a conjecture for yes. how it's supposed to go? Uh, yes. So so uh, the conjecture is that. Oh, actually, I don't know if this is a question you're asking, but the con conjecture is that actually it is fully invariant. So there is actually an L infinity morphism. Uh, quasi equivalence or something. 
But is it, it, is it, is it supposed to be the obvious map that counts uh, things in the... Uh, it, the map is a little bit hard to describe. Um, so you, you're right that there's... So, okay, so, so I haven't actually described this thing at, at all, but you're right that there's, there's an obvious candidate for a map, but it's actually missing some terms. Uh, and so the, the annoyance, the whole technical annoyance is trying to figure out the error terms. Um, so the first conjecture is that this is actually fully invariant. Uh, so meaning that the L infinity structure actually is invariant under whatever the correct notion of equivalence of L infinity algebras is. But uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Can you also have like zigzags, the notion of equivalence, or? Uh, like map, map. You could. I think the, the standard notion of equivalence for L infinity algebras doesn't require zigzags. Um, okay, so the conjecture is that this one, this is fully invariant, and the second one uh, is that this should be functorial under exact Lagrangian cobordisms. So this is something like. If you have an exact Lagrangian cobordism between lambda plus and lambda minus, then you get an L infinity morphism between the L infinity algebras. And again, the, so the first order part of this is already done. That's this work of Ekholm Honda Kaman. Um, and I think it should be true in general. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a student who's working on a bit of this right now. Let's see how this goes. Um, okay, so other questions? Um, I feel like in the spirit of honesty, I should at least instead of just saying, giving this as an existence result, like there exists an L infinity algebra, I should try to draw you a picture. So the picture is, uh, it has been alluded to already um, by what I said before, which is that just that now what we're doing is we're counting. So this is one plus lambda again. Now instead of counting this with a uh, single positive end, there might be multiple positive ends. So you could have something looks like maybe this. And if you have a disk that looks like this, so let me call this uh, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, then what this would contribute is this would contribute a term to L2 of A1, A2. So just think these are the, the inputs for L2 are two things up at the top. And then the output is just the, the words down at the bottom. So this is going to be A3, A4, Maybe there's some coefficient in front of this, but this this is the sort of the general idea. So it's a, this is sort of the, the most obvious thing you could think of, um, and then you extend you extend all of these. So L three would then count disks with three positive ends, etc. And then you extend to the entire algebra by uh, the Leibniz rule. Um, okay. And the abelianization was just for convenience. Or? The uh, the abelianization actually does show up uh, in the proof of that this is an, so uh, so there's okay right so um actually let me get back to that in a second uh so the picture seems fairly simple and the question is why oh uh, no i can answer your question now so um the reason you need the abelianization so not all disks will look like this where you have the positive ends together and then all the negative ends together so in general you might have positive neg negative ends so, sort of interspersed and then the most, the easiest way to, to take account of this is not to care about ordering at all and just to abelianize. Um, there is actually a technical reason to want to abelianize that has to do with uh, for links. It turns out that without this, um, I couldn't get the L infinity relations to work out. Uh, for knots, maybe it's okay. The DGA is okay. The DGA is okay. Um, and in fact, for knots, you can come up with some sort of L infinity algebra that. It doesn't fully pass to the abelianization, but it takes like the cyclic, you quotient out by cyclic permutations or something. Okay. And that actually works, but for links, somehow it does not. Uh, right, so so this, I think the, the idea is fairly simple. And the reason that it's taken so long to do is that there is like very, there, there's some sort of fundamental uh, technical issue that one has to overcome, which is essentially that 
you know, in checking all of these things, like up here checking that d squared is equal to zero, or over here checking the L infinity relations, you have to do something with and it's a standard floor theory theoretic argument where you take a one dimensional moduli space, see how it degenerates. Um, and, you know, usually it'll degenerate into nice things that will correspond to these various terms here. Uh, but there's a bad degeneration in this case here that uh, does generically show up in this sort of relative version of symbolic field theory and maybe not in the absolute version. And this is boundary, uh, boundary degeneration. So you can have, sorry. So I'll, I'll draw it again in the cartoon version. So here's some sort of one parameter family of holomorphic disks, and this can degenerate into something like this. So this is now two holomorphic disks that intersect somewhere on their boundary. Um, and there are ways to get around this, uh, but they involve work. So like the way, the way that I use um, is based off of the idea of string topology and, and adding in some sort of string to topological co correction terms, which actually in this particular setting, you can write things down <clears throat> completely combinatorially. There aren't any issues with you know, um, technical issues involving string topology. But, but this is sort of, this is the, this is the reason that, uh, so um, this, this necessitates um, incorporation of string topological corrections. It turns out that in this setting, the, the uh, worst issue is um, to L2. So it's, it's the next level after the, the sort of classical uh, DG algebra picture. Uh, but this, this uh, involves a lot of pain. And this is somehow you have to add these error corrections to L2, and then they propagate around. And so check, checking that all of these L infinity relations still hold once, actually do hold once you put in these error terms was somehow I, I, I couldn't get a good grip on it uh, in some sort of high level way. And so I ended up just sort of doing everything combinatorially and it did work out, but it was, it was a horrible pain. Um, okay. Uh, oh, and the, so uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, is that uh, actually this horrible pain is not so bad for the not case, but uh, if we want this to be functorial under cobordisms, then it's very important that we allow for the case where the Legendrian has multiple components. Uh, and <clears throat> for the multiple component case, this, these, um, these corrections become even worse. And in, in particular, they in, start involving um, fractions. So they start involving one halves. And that's, that's why, in fact, I didn't put it in here anywhere, but um, I have to assume here that K doesn't have characteristic two. Um, and unfortunately, once you do that, then, then that also means that you have to actually keep track of signs very carefully. And that was a terrible mess. Okay. Great. Okay, so um, what does this L infinity algebra actually give you? Like, what's so this is some sort of abstract structure, but uh, one thing that's a little bit easier to describe that it gives you is um, that L2 induces. Uh, so I mentioned that L2 uh, looks like a Lie bracket, but it doesn't satisfy Jacobi. But if you pass to homology with respect to L1, which is to say, if you go to the Legendrian contact homology, then these error terms drop out and then the L2 actually does define an honest Lie bracket. So um, the corollary is that L2 in induces a, actually it's even better than a Lie bracket because by the way it's constructed, uh, it satisfies the uh, Leibniz rule with respect to uh, usual associative multiplication on this DG algebra. So it, and it induces a Poisson bracket on Legendre contact homology of lambda. Uh, and this, this thing that I said that it's invariant up through L2, that's enough to then say that this is, um, so this is now a Poisson algebra, and this is actually invariant. And the Poisson algebra. Okay, so 
Um, what we have done through this, this process in particular is to boost this invariant, which is called Legendre contact homology from being, um, well, before it was some sort of graded algebra, uh, and now it's actually a graded Poisson algebra. And, and the Poisson structure on this is actually invariant. Um, <clears throat> Uh, okay. And I should say, so maybe this is not the, uh, I, I've been trying to advertise this to various audiences, but I have not quite figured out what's going on yet. So um, this gives you a whole whole um, family of Poisson brackets on polynomial rings that seem interesting to me, but I don't know anything about Poisson brackets on polynomial rings. So I'm just going to advertise this. So if you have a positive braid, Uh, which I'll call beta, um, then you get a Legendrean link out of it, which I'll write as lambda sub beta. And this is what's called the rainbow closure sub beta. Um, and what does rainbow closure mean? So if you just draw your braids from left to right, like this, um, this is a three braid, then you can turn this into a Legendrean link for the front projection for a Legendrean link by doing this. Um, and in this case, uh, so in this case, um, actually all of the higher L infinity operations beyond L2 are all zero, or then L is three. And what this tells you is this actually gets, this gives you a Poisson bracket on, uh, the polynomial ring generated by now these these things now I can state them even more simply it's just the crossings of beta so this is the crossings of beta but anyway it's it's just some polynomial ring um, uh, and in the case where uh, so for beta is a, a two braid which is sigma one to the uh, something even. So this, so this so something like this. So n equals two. Uh, you can you can run this process, and what you end up with is you end up with a Poisson bracket uh, on one of these. Uh, I guess n in this case is two m. You get a Poisson bracket on this polynomial ring, and this Poisson bracket is actually known. It's something that people have studied before. It's called the Flaschka Newell bracket. Um, which is, I, my notes have attributed to a paper from 1982. So this, this has been around for a while. Uh, but in fact, it's just a, a special case of a whole family of, of Poisson brackets on these polynomial algebras. And I have no idea if they are new in general, if people have thought about them, uh, people in algebra have thought about these. Um, maybe these are new in general. I don't know. Uh, fantastic. Um, so I think in my, so uh, I'm allowed an hour, is that correct? Okay. So in my remaining time, I'm going to actually probably, so what, what I would like to do is I would like to place this Poisson bracket in some, in some context in terms of some uh, geometry that, that uh, is more familiar maybe to, uh, people who work on the fluid theoretic side of, of this picture. Uh, and so this, let's see, oh, I'll just leave that so here. Um, and so, so yeah, what I want to do is, is give some geometric interpretation for some of these sort of algebraic invariants. And this is going to be through um, the correspondence between fillings and what are called augmentations. Um, so I already told you what a filling was, right? So a filling was, uh, so if I have a Legendrian link lambda here, a filling is some sort of cohortism with it up, up at the top and with the empty set down at the bottom. Um, so given, um, given a filling uh, lambda, 
Um, <clears throat> so it is now gone from the board, but so there's there's a cobordism map, and the cobordism map now will go from the DG algebra of lambda to the DG algebra of the empty set, which is just the base field. So what we get is so we get a cobordism map. Um, from this to the DG algebra of the empty set, which is just the base field with the zero differential on it. Uh, and this is so this is this sort of so this is a DG algebra map like this. And this is this has a name, so this is usually called an augmentation of a lambda. Um, but it's actually you can do a little bit better than this in this particular case, which is that um, it actually gives an entire family of cobordism maps if you keep track of homology classes a little bit more carefully. So the, the more precise statement is that so actually uh, filling equips with a rank one local system. Um, so in this case, you could on L, sorry, on the filling. So that this uh, for uh, people like me who don't understand these sorts of things, this is just a homomorphism um, from H1 of L to so the group H1 of L to just group of multiplicative groups of units in K. Um, so a filling equipped with a rank one local system on L actually gives an augmentation. So this is uh, so it's, again just sort of keeping more careful track of of homology classes of boundaries of holomorphic disks. Uh, so what does this mean? So let me restate this. Um, so I'll state this in terms of uh, what's called the augmentation variety. So the definition. So the augmentation variety of a Legendrian uh, length lambda is so so it is aug of lambda, and this is going to be the collection of augmentations, just algebraic maps, DG algebra maps from a lambda b to k zero, uh, and. Uh, to be exactly precise about this, I need to mod out by some sort of equivalence, uh, which I won't get into. So to, for, for this, for the purposes of what I'm saying, uh, just ignore that modding out by equivalence. Um, so any filling, so any filling, so what I said was that any filling equipped with a rank one local system gives me a point inside of this variety. So this, this is some sort of variety, affine variety sitting inside of K to the number of rib cores, I guess. Um, and any filling gives gives us, well, if you don't equip it with a rank one local system, then what it does is it uh, produces a chart inside of this augmentation variety, which is isomorphic to some sort of algebraic torus. Um, so what this is, is this is K star to the first Betty number of L, right? That's that's the rank of H1 of L. Uh, and this is going to map into augmentations of um, Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, since I gave this example before of the trefoil, um, the augmentation variety of this uh, sits inside of an affine three dimensional space. And what it is is it looks like one plus x plus z plus x one z equals zero sitting inside of kdq. And for those of you who know a little bit about Legendrian contact homology, um, I drew the trap really here before. The three red cords are x, y, and z there. Um, and this is the this is this space of augmentations. Um, so, okay.
Um, so what happens in this in this example of the trefoil? And this is a this is actually a special case of something that I won't have time to get to, which involves cluster structures. Is that they're actually so Ethelmana and Kalman tell us that there are at least five fillings of the trefoil that are different up to Hamiltonian isotopy. And what they do is they they each give some sort of charge from uh, K star squared into this this. So this variety is what this is a two dimensional variety, um, and so we have five two dimensional algebraic tori that sort of sit like this, and they actually cover all of. So these five charts cover the entirety of the augmentation variety of lambda. Uh, and the fact that they that they don't overlap, I mean, that they aren't identical to each other actually tells you that all of these five fillings are distinct from each other. Um, and there's some sort of interesting question about how to classify fillings for a, okay, maybe I, I won't get into this. Um, so what I what I did want to say is this is a picture that that people in cluster algebra world had seen before, uh, and what happens in this case is that each of these algebraic tori uh, has has a nice symplectic form on it, which uh, if if the algebraic tori are given by uh, parameters like s one and s two, then the nice symplectic form is something like d log s one, which d log s two. So on each of these charts, you get some sort of symplectic form and the nice thing is that they actually agree on the overlap. So you get a symplectic form on the entire augmentation variety. And this, this was sort of the motivation for, for me to uh, resuscitate this world, this work with infinity algebras, because in fact, this, so this statement was that in this particular setting, the, uh, the augmentation variety has a symplectic form on it, which is some, something slightly unexpected. Um, and in fact, you can now see this as some sort of dual version of uh, something about the L infinity structure. So uh, what, what you should think is um, the augmentation variety is somehow dual to the Legendrian contact homology. Think of it as like being spec of, of the Legendrian contact homology. And then what happens is that this Poisson bracket, which is induced by L2, uh, dualizes. Um, so L2. And remember, this is a Poisson bracket on the linear, oh, sorry, on the Legendrian contact homology. So this now dualizes. So this Poisson bracket. So here's a theorem. So the theorem is that there exists a symplectic form. Um, it's actually so if if you if your favorite field is the complexes and this is a holomorphic symplectic form um, on this augmentation variety uh, and it gives this augmentation variety uh, the structure of a of an affine symplectic manifold which is invariant under isotopy so oh, and it's invariant under isotopy. The nice thing is that fiber-wise, at, at a single point, this symplectic form actually uh, is something that that we have known for a long time, and this is uh, this is essentially the duality map that was uh, defined by Josh Sabloff many years ago, and that I understand maybe he alluded to when he was speaking here recently. Um, so, so I'm going to call this the Sabloff symplectic form. Uh, if you're curious, by the way, what it is for the trefoil example. Um, it is, I think it's dx, d log x wedge d log z. So it's dx wedge dz over xd. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, so this, this, uh, this symplectic form, so again, fiber wise, point by point, this, this just recovers something that was already known, which is the non degeneracy of this, this two form is. Uh, is Savov duality, but then the fact that that you can globalize this into an actual closed form on the entire augmentation variety that follows from the fact that L two satisfies the L infinity relations, and that's something that I think was not known before. Um, and again, conjecturally, so so this is great. So we had this invariant that we knew about before, which was the augmentation variety of Legendre knot, 
or link, uh, but now there's this additional structure on it. So it's, it seems to be much stronger. It's now not just some affine variety, but it's actually a symplectic affine variety. And the conjecture is again that, well, so we know that that's invariant, but the conjecture, and I'll just stop here after this, is that uh, this is functorial again under, under Lagrangian, exact Lagrangian cohortism. Um, so if I have a cohortism between lambda plus and lambda minus, then you get an actual symplectic map between the augmentation varieties of the two things. Um, not completely sure what this is good for yet, uh, but it seems sort of intriguing. And um, <clears throat> what, what I will not get to, but uh, it's sort of motivated this was that uh, there is a well-defined version of this whole theory on the side of cluster theory for positive braids. And it turns out that the, it agrees with what, what we've, uh, what I've discussed here. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Questions? I guess uh, I see that's so, uh, so I guess Trefoil is an example of a rainbow of closure here or the positive red closure. So that's yes. synthetic from you mentioned that, that agrees with that symplectic form that you're saying? Yes, so in fact, yeah, so uh, this symplectic form, this so for positive braids, this augmentation variety has shown up elsewhere in the literature. Sometimes it's called a braid variety or various other things. And it's known that there is a symplectic form on there. And so in this work that uh, of, of me and the collaborators I wrote down before, we actually show that in this, for this family of Legendrian links, that symplectic form agrees with the one that, um, that I've defined here. Uh, but the nice thing about uh, the L infinity picture is that this should generalize that. So it, that works for any Legendrian link, whether or not it's of this form. So you get just a whole, a much larger family of these things with some like forms on them. Yes. Do you have examples of Legendrian knots with the same augmentation variety, but a different Oh, uh, good. So, right. So, if I'm claiming that this is a better invariant than just the augmentation variety by itself, it would be nice to have an example. I don't yet. Yeah, but it, it seems, yeah, I, I just haven't thought too hard about it yet. And is it like, is there any hope of reconstructing a Legendre not from this data of augmentation variety? Of ah. this? I think no, because there are actually Legendrian knots with the same. Augmentation varieties, including this, that are not the same Legendrian knots. But are they like very different Legendrian knots, or like how? Uh, how different are they? So you you could get have things that are even like topologically not the same. But even if you restrict to things that have the same topological type, um, you can come up with. I mean, there are various types of knots, like twist knots, where we can classify all the Legendrian representatives, and it still works there. Uh, but a, a follow up to your question would be so. Maybe if I claim this is functorial, then there's there's a lot of interest in trying to obstruct the existence of cohortisms between Legendrians. And this this seems like this would be a useful technique for that. Uh, again, I don't have any actual examples right now. Chris. Is this an example of a shifted uh, Lagrangian structure? Yes, it is. Uh, yes. And so for in for Legendrian services, uh, uh, would, would the same argument show that it's uh, Lagrangian? So uh, presumably you could hope to do this in higher dimensions. Um, th this L infinity business that I was talking about here, I've only worked out in dimension one. So th but things might actually get easier in higher dimension. Um, th there are some things that are trickier in this low dimensional case. Um, I think the, the actual answer to your question is I don't know, but it's possible. What was your comment about the number of fillings or classifying fillings? That oh, so um, oh, so it's, I mean, there's a there's a general motivating question, at least for me, which is just given a fixed Legendrian, like, can you classify the the fillings of this? And as far as I know, so um, there is no Legendrian knot or link where we know where we can completely classify the fillings up to Hamiltonian isotopy, except in two cases. One is if there are none. And one is if it is the unknot, and Eliashberg Polterovich tell you there's exactly one filling. But even like for the, the hop flink is maybe a nice example. We know that there are two fillings of the hop flink, uh, and we can show that they're different, but it's an open problem to show that those are the only fillings. Um, uh, but there's some there's some conjecture because that's so anything that's in this rainbow closure case, of which these are all examples. Um, 
there is a conjecture about exactly, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between, there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between fillings and uh, what are called cluster seeds of, of the augmentation variety. Um, again, we don't know that this is true in any possible example, except for the unknots, but that's the guess. This is a conjecture of Casals. And there's some partial work on, in this direction, but it's all from sort of the lower, it's finding lower bounds for the numbers of fillings and not. And I see, like, so that one from correspondence is to be proven, but in the case of maybe trefoid, let's say there are five cluster seeds, is that? There are five cluster seeds, that's right. Yeah. You'll expect five, I see. Mm -hmm. What are cluster seeds? <laughs> so, right, so there are these, so these augmentation varieties are, in positive braid land, these are these are examples of what are called cluster A varieties. And any cluster A variety, um, so it comes equipped with a bunch of charts, which are actually these charts that I've written here, but they have sort of nice coordinates on them. And then on overlaps between charts, the coordinates, the change of coordinates is given by some sort of mutation. Um, and so so there's there's some notion, yeah. So there's this notion of a cluster A variety where you can uh, cover your variety up to co-dimension two by these cluster charts and in such a way that they're supposed to overlap, uh, behave nicely on their overlaps. And each of these charts is what I'm calling a cluster seed. Um, there's some correspondence to quivers. You can get a quiver from one of these braids and then some notion of mutation of quivers. It's getting, this is getting beyond what I know offhand. Yeah. Are these more general than algebraic varieties in some sense, or affine algebraic varieties? Or uh, these are more specific. So that it's a very it's a very um, rigid thing. So uh, most varieties don't have these structures on them. It's a fairly rigid construction. Um, yeah. So in particular, if you have a cluster structure, then it you it's fairly easy to read off like the cohomology of the variety from that. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Lenny again. Thanks.